can get started. So thank you for joining us today. I'm Cliff Lynch and I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information. I'll be doing a brief introduction for this session. This session is one of the uh, one of the synchronous uh, project briefings that are part of the CNI Spring 2021 virtual member meeting. Uh, this week, we have done a number of synchronous uh, project briefings. We'll be doing one more at four o'clock Eastern tomorrow. Next week, we will have um, some plenary presentations on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to close out the uh, virtual meeting. And I hope you can join us for uh, some or all of those as well. I do want to remind you that for this spring meeting, we are making heavier use than uh, in the past of pre-recorded um, uh, presentations, which are available uh, to participants on demand. And um, I invite you to uh, have a look at those. And um, I think you'll find quite a uh, rich assortment of topics covered and hopefully a number of things that will be of uh, value to you. This session, like basically all the sessions at the CNI um, Spring Virtual Meeting are being recorded and this will be publicly available after the conclusion of the meeting. A couple of mechanical things. Um, there is a chat um, as part of uh, the Zoom session. Please feel free to use that um, to um, comment, uh, make introductions, uh, or um, any for any other purpose you want. Uh, there is a Q&A tool at the uh, bottom of your screen. And after we hear from the presenters, uh, Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will moderate a Q&A session at the uh, end of the presentations. Also, I would note closed captioning is available and please avail yourself of that if it's helpful. I think that's all the mechanics I need to cover. And let me just briefly introduce our three presenters, Megan Oakleaf, Ken Varnum, and Shane Nackerud. Um, the topic here is a really important one and it's about how to bring the library and the data that the library holds into the broader conversations about campus analytics as they relate to student learning and student success. Um, this has been a complicated um, issue uh, where we've seen a certain um, discomfort, shall we say, around um, some of the values that the of, of privacy and anonymity that the uh, library community has championed. And the, you know, very, um, very noble intentions of the work on learning analytics and student success. Uh, there aren't totally simple answers here. And uh, uh, Megan and her colleagues have been, um, you know, really at the center of exploring many of these questions. And um, uh, Joan Lippincott, our director, our associate director emerita, um, has also been involved in some of these questions over the years and continues to uh, uh, be engaged in those discussions. And with that as context, I just want to thank our presenters. I'm really delighted that you brought this work to CNI. I'm sure you're going to get quite a few questions from the uh, uh, from the participants in, in this session. Um, and uh, thank you again. Um, and let me thank everybody for joining us. At this point, I will be quiet, disappear, and turn it over to Megan, who will lead off the presentation. Thank you, Cliff. I appreciate that very much. Um, and you're right, this territory is complicated. So that's, I guess that's part of what makes it fun. Um, so thank you for joining our presentation on adding a library profile to Caliper, bringing the library into the campus learning analytics conversation. I'm really thrilled to be talking about this project. We haven't gotten to do that much given the last year. And I'm pleased to be here with my colleagues, Ken and Shane. 
um, who are brilliant and I love working with them. So I'm, I'm really happy that we can all be here today. I want to acknowledge that this project was funded by IMLS and we would not have been able to do it without them. IMLS has been funding quite a bit of, of research in this library learning analytics space over the last several years, including the Data Doubles Project, Prioritizing Privacy, the Library Learning Analytics Project at Michigan, um, Leela, the, the precursor to the grant we're talking about today and the project we're talking about today, and CLASS. So we're very grateful uh, to have this, this work enabled to think about how libraries can and or should get engaged in the campus learning analytics conversation. So um, I, I get to start off today. The, the overview though um, covers all of our topics. So I'm first gonna give you um, a project overview for class. And then Ken's gonna follow with an introduction to Caliper and the library and the Caliper library profile. And Shane's gonna um, wrap us up with what's next for the Caliper library profile. And then we're really eager to get your questions and comments and, and have a nice discussion. So uh, I wanna begin by talking about the class project um, from uh, the perspective of some of the, the reasons why we wanted to get involved and sort of just set some, some definitions so that we can all um, have a clearer conversation. So one of the things that I wanna begin with is a good definition um, of learning analytics. And this is complicated because the term learning analytics gets used very differently in libraries um, than it does in the rest of higher education. So um, in libraries, I frequently have colleagues referring to um, using the term learning analytics to refer to assessment um, or correlation studies. And learning analytics in the larger scheme of higher education is a, a slightly different thing. And um, not being clear about definitions muddies the waters and makes it harder to talk about. So I wanted to provide a uh, definition so that we all know what we're talking about today in this presentation. So I went with the higher education uh, usage of this term or, or um, the use of institution level systems that collect individual level student learning data, centralize it in a warehouse or record store and serve as a unified source for research seeking to understand and support student learning and success. So we're talking about um, learner record store at the institutional level or perhaps consortium um, uh, and individual level data, um, that, that sort of use, not the sort of broader um, library assessment or one-off correlation studies that are episodic in nature. Um, learning analytics is used to help educators discover, diagnose, and predict um, what's going wrong or understand what's going right um, with learning and learner success, and then to do something about it, right? So what's wrong? What's not going well? What's go what is going well that we want to keep doing? And what can we do about it? And this is really essential, particularly for students who might not already be aware of the unwritten and hard to decipher uh, rules and practices in higher education. So it's about um, you know, figuring out what's going on and then doing something about it. So intervention sounds kind of experimental, but it's really just doing something with information, which is something librarians know a lot about. Um, so interventions can include macro level changes or sort of individual level um, uh, occurrences. So at the macro level, and there's a lot of a tremendous amount of power in this, although sometimes in um, conversations it gets overlooked, is that learning analytics can help us uncover um, systematic and structural problems um, that students and learners are encountering and figuring out how to, and help us learn how to change those things through changes in practice, changes in processes, changes in policies to, in sort of a broad swath, improve learner experiences and get rid of obstacles that have been hindering students that maybe we weren't aware of or only understood superficially, right? So making big changes um, based on new learning from understanding um, trends in the data. It can also be used to facilitate individual level things um, that are important on, on a smaller scale, but extrapolated over multiple students and to each individual student make an enormous difference. So that might be providing learners with insights into their own learning behaviors by giving them back their own data um, it might be notifying students or their educational support, support partners, librarians, advisors, um, uh, tutorial center folks, uh, faculty of events, patterns, or milestones that they might be unaware of um, 
uh, it also might include prompting or referring students, encouraging them to gain assistance from the ser services that are available or otherwise link students. So in many ways, um, these interventions are things that a good and caring educator would do if they knew to do them. Um, and because so many of our institutions operate at such enormous scales, uh, things can fall through the cracks. Lots of things can fall through the cracks. So huge hurdles go unrecognized. With learning analytics, we might be able to find them and change them. Um, individuals don't get connected with the supports they need when they need them, um, oftentimes because of scale. And this can help us fix that problem as well. So those are the kinds of interventions that we're talking about coming out of learning analytics. So why might libraries want to be involved? Um, we know that very few libraries are involved in this work as we've defined it, right? With the higher education definition that um, they collect individual level, in this case, library use data, student library use data and contribute it to a centralized store. Most libraries are not doing that. So there are consequences to that that we need to consider or results um, of that that we need to consider. Um, one of the dangers is that we continue to design for average. So most of our current assessment approaches um, give us um, self-report data in some cases, um, aggregated data, non-individual you know, individual identified data. And so we aggregate them, we pull it all together and we put it in a large lump and we design the best we can for that lump of information that we get from our assessments. And sometimes that results in designing for average. Um, we also, as I said, we tend to rely on assessment approaches that uh, depend on self-reported data. Oftentimes the samples of the population are very, um, the response rate is low, or it might be representative of the institution overall, but doesn't give sufficient insight to what is happen happening for certain pockets of students. And speaking of, of, of groups of students, we also, with less power um, in the information we're using, might miss intersections, right? We, we talk a lot about dividing students by race, um, gender, different types of um, Pell status, for example. But looking at the intersections of these identities can get lost or be difficult or impossible to do. We end up with really low N um, that we don't feel we can't report out because we don't want to identify anyone. Um, but we so we miss those intersections. You know what is going on with Latina female physics students in the second semester of their sophomore year? Right? Is there a problem with that? Are they pulling out of the the that particular science track and going somewhere else? We we might miss things that are focused on an intersectional identity of students' academic lives. So I think we need to recognize and think about the fact that while any harm that we've done by designing for average is definitely inadvertent and not purposeful, it can still exist. And so for equity purposes, we need to think about um, how we understand the student experience, how we understand what helps them be successful and what might hinder them from being successful. That was a lot, that was just the first bullet. <laughs> what other consequences might there be? Um, so if you don't participate, uh, if libraries don't participate in institutional learning analytics, um, libraries go uncounted, right? So we, we can't be included in those holistic and institutional pictures of understanding student learning and success, how we contribute. And it necessarily um, degrades the quality of the overall campus data picture. So if the data is incomplete, if it's got a hole in it, um, then that the decisions that are made based on that information um, are more problematic than they would be if there was a complete picture. So we need to think about what, it, what the consequences are of going uncounted. Um, we can also be challenged sometimes to answer thoroughly questions about the ways in which libraries help or inadvertently hinder student learning and success. Uh, we don't have the longitudinal and detailed data that we might like to have. Um, the last two are also really important that we might seed our roles as um, uh, influential, essential partners at the table. If we don't you know, pull a seat up to the table, uh, we might not be invited and we might not so much lose our seat, but you know, forget to sit down um, and not be there when important conversations are going on. And you know, they say decisions are made by those who show up and we wanna show up and be part of the decision-making. And then finally, we may miss opportunities to infuse library values of privacy and confidentiality. Those are far from 
you know, being only library values, lots of our partners on campus care about those values, but they might not see it the same way we do. And so if we don't participate, we can't share our perspectives on those, on those value and ethics related um, areas. So I want to turn to the project. That was a little bit of what underpinned the project. I want to talk about the project itself. Um, so who was involved? I was the PI for the project and um, was just so pleased to work with an amazing team. You can see there's lots of different organizations involved here. University of Michigan, University of Minnesota, Lewis and Clark Community College from a library perspective, the con uh, consortium Unison, um, OCLC was a strong partner, IMS Global uh, that creates educational technology standards. Um, so lots of folks involved and the three of us are here today, but everyone had a piece of what we did. So some of our uh, project outcomes, things we intended to, to do is um, with the LILA project, we had started forming some partnerships and collaborations, which led to that slide you just saw, uh, but we wanted to cement those connections and really make sure that those partnerships um, were fully formed and articulated and would last um, going into the future. We also wanted to design proofs of concepts that would serve as models for future pro projects, connecting library data with institutional learning analytics. We wanted to, we knew from the outside, outset, uh, develop library data profiles for Caliper so to enable the technology set, uh, part of uh, conveying library data to um, institutional or other record stores. And then finally recommend ways in which those prototypes and examples and models um, can enable the use of library data to help students. Now, we didn't start from scratch. A lot of what we began with came from the LILA project. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with LILA. LILA is the Library Integration and Institutional Learning Analytics Project, another IMLS-funded project, which um, uh, enabled a series of three meetings um, over the course of a year that brought so many big brains to the table to talk about what learning analytics could do, might do, what it shouldn't do um, with, in terms of library involvement. And one of the main takeaways from that first project was a prioritized set of almost 100 user stories that would express what librarians, students, faculty, academic advisors, institutional leaders, institutional researchers might uh, want to be able to get out of um, library integration into learning analytics. So we wrote those as um, user stories, which are generally written as, as some stakeholder, I want to be able to do this thing in order to solve a problem, achieve an outcome, meet a need. And so the Leela paper includes all of those pages of um, user stories. And we, as a part of the Leela project, prioritized them and those prioritized user stories fed into what we focused on in class. So the, the foundation came from Leela um, to, to have that work already set to get into the class work. There were three phases to the class project. We had two in-person meetings back in the days when we could have in-person meetings. Um, OCLC, OCLC hosted them in Dublin, Ohio, and we all came together to talk about our plan and they finalize our partnerships and make drafts of our plans, a lot of whiteboarding. Um, meeting two, we finished the specifications or we thought we did um, and we had them pretty close, but then when it came time to really formalize it and get it approved through the process and have it ready for the, the white paper, which was at the end, um, we, we spent another good many hours uh, meeting uh, virtually throughout two, uh, 2020 to get the work done. So there was at least three phases um, of the project, although. That last one was pretty long. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Ken. He's gonna talk about the Caliper Library Profile. Thank you, Megan. Um, so uh, I'm uh, Ken Varn of University of Michigan. And now that we've had that very uh, eloquent and high level explanation of the need for learning analytics, I'm going to risk giving you all whiplash and bring you quickly down to the kind of the, the, the five foot level from maybe the 5,000 foot level where we were and get into what the heck we're talking about with the Caliper library profile. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Caliper in general, it is a set of specifications that are managed by IMS Global to help uh, structure data about various kinds of learning interactions uh, within an academic institution. Uh, on this screen on the right, you can see all of the different profiles that have been defined so far, which the library profile 
maybe the newest, but it's certainly uh, one of many that have gone before it. And each profile is, is designed to structure data about a, some kind of transaction in a campus environment. So things that students might do in a learning management system like Canvas or Blackboard, things they might do interacting with a grading system, um, watching videos, all sorts of uh, things like that. Um, and there was not a, a libraries are you know delightfully idiosyncratic, um, but apparently everybody else is too because they have all these different profiles. And we we spent you know we determined very quickly that there was not a great way to shoehorn the kinds of interactions we anticipated wanting to know about in libraries based on the user stories into an existing profile. Hence, we had to design our own. Uh, next slide, please. So these profiles are, uh, are, are defined as triples. Um, they are at their very, and so it's just a stream of data, a, a giant text file that essentially says someone did something. An actor performed an action on an object. Um, and at, you know, it, and that, that is probably not all that exciting in some cases but it provides a framework that can be built on in the context that a particular library or a particular learning researcher wants to find out more, uh, more information about. Um, any particular one of these items, each of these three uh, parts of the triple can be expanded on, detailed uh, to whatever degree is desired and is useful for the, the particular research that's being undertaken. So if the picture is worth a thousand words, um, clearly that doesn't say at all. So if we go to the next slide, I can give you a few more words. Um, in examples for library type actions, you, you could have something that was you know, very generic. A student used a library. That's you know, very nice. It helps you count how many students might have used the library. And if you're thinking in the physical space, that might be a gate count, basically, how many people walked in. A student accessed an article. Um, which is also something uh, useful and you know more on the counting side. Uh, a student attended reference consultation. These are all very, very simple, straightforward statements of facts, statements of things that happened. Um, and the profile goes into much more detail about the vocabularies that are allowed uh, within the standard for the actors, the actions, and the objects. Um, they're all controlled but they can also be decorated. Um, you can add as much uh, or as little detail about it as you like. So next slide, please. Um, when you, the, the, the learning data stores that receive these caliper events um, that can you know, ingest these and, and put them into some data structure for future analysis, uh, can be built, you know, they essentially, they, they take what they receive, so they can become very complex. Um, you know, it'd be three, co three, three columns, basically, in a, in a simple table, actor, action, object, but you can also add everything else. Um, and you can quickly get very much more detailed if that suits your research needs and your privacy policies and, and what you want to do. So you could say that student accesses digital resource you could also say student with ID number something accesses digital resource with a DOI of something. You could get a lot more detailed if that was the data you wanted to present. You could go with uh, student with ID this and name this and then registered in the third semester of a five-year program and so on. You, you could put as much data into that as you as made sense for you and as made sense for your institution. Um, it, the, the possibilities are, are nearly endless. So next slide. With that kind of as the framework for Caliper, um, it's very flexible and very much uh, able to be put in tune with your institution and your library uh, based on the learning research, the outcomes that you want to, want to investigate. Uh, we started thinking about how we wanted to structure this profile. Um, it became very clear to us that it wasn't going to be just there wasn't going to be one this kind of event because libraries do lots of different things and it became we, we started out thinking well we'll just have this a library event that you could expand on and make incredibly complicated and beautiful and decorated and it very quickly came to be that we were writing moby dick uh every time that we sent a single event 
when we really wanted to write Old Man in the Sea, something much more succinct, much more terse, and much more useful. Um, so we ended up settling after the kinds of long discussions that only a bunch of, of librarians and computer programmers can have about what things mean into three very discrete uh, types of events. There is a library use event, which we really focused on the physical space of a library or a physical space being used in some context for the library. Library resource use, which was all about the stuff the library provides people, whether that's physical, uh, the physical books, uh, digital resources, anything else that is a resource the library in some ways mediates access to. And then library participation, uh, which is a human to human interaction in a library context. It could be physical in person. Um, remember when we wrote this back, that was all, you know, that was great. You could do that kind of thing all the time. Uh, it could be virtual. Uh, it could be an email exchange uh, for an Ask a Librarian reference question or any kind of thing at all, uh, training sessions. And so at, we, we kind of narrowed things down to those three uh, broad use cases. And I want to walk quickly the next three slides through the kinds of things we contemplated needing uh, for each of these. Um, so for the library use event, we only had one action used. Um, again, we were torn between wanting to be very precise and very something that would let us do really quick research or quick analysis later on and something that was generic enough so we didn't need to do that. Um, it doesn't necessarily fit every single case perfectly, but as a concept, a, per, a, a person used a space is you know, pretty good. Um, the kinds of things we talked about were libraries and library spaces. Um, libraries were intended to be whatever made sense in a particular institution for the biggest umbrella concept of the library. It could be an entire building which might contain multiple sub-libraries and collections and meeting spaces and name spaces within the bigger room, all the kinds of things that we love to do with our spaces. And then a library space is that lower level and you could make things nested so that you could go to the library and be in a library space, in a bigger library space, in a library building. Um, because again, that reflects the reality of many of our spaces. Um, for uh, library resource use, Again, um, on the next slide, it is, again, similarly uh, a little bit, the, ver the action, the verb we decided was just access. Um, we're, had, uh, we spent too long debating whether you accessed a book when you pulled it off the shelf. Um, we decided that we weren't going to worry about that after probably too many hours, but we ended up with access as the catch-all verb for all ways that an individual could take advantage of the information contained in something the library provided. And then we tried to keep it again, relatively simple and broke the world down into physical resources and digital resources, each of which could come with all sorts of optional decorations, optional identifiers. We suggested a handful that might be most generally useful. These are not requirements, um, but they are things so that when our library in Minnesota, for example, might compare checkout histories in some way, we might have a hope of having similar underlying data to compare and be able to do closer comparisons. Um, if these don't make sense for a particular institution, you don't have to use them, you can use your own. Um, if you have a shelf listing number that makes sense to you, that, that'd be fantastic to include. Um, and then finally, uh, we had the library participation event. Again, we wanted to keep the verbs the uh, as small uh, as few a number as possible attend doesn't necessarily fit Do you attend a reference interaction a reference session with a single subject specialist maybe that's not the way we think about it but again it sort of catches everything together into one uh, into one verb to use and then the object of that again keeping it generic is an activity and much as with the digital resources and physical resources we suggested some common vocabulary, but these are by no, no means prescriptive or exhaustive um, and are meant to just kind of help you, help you as a library generating these events out of your existing data streams or existing tracking mechanisms uh, to, to, make it more, to, to make it more consistent uh, across institutions. 
So what is one of the, oh, and then uh, uh, before I get into an example of what one looks like on the next slide, you, know, you were right to advance, Megan, sorry. Um, we have the actors, the subjects of the sentence. And again, we wanted this to be incredibly flexible, recognizing that what is what makes sense to describe the person doing the action falls under a whole range of policy, sometimes legal, other rules and requirements, practices uh, across institutions, both at the library level and at the institution level. So we were perhaps the least prescriptive when we described what an actor is. At the very least, you have to declare whether it was a person or a machine doing the interaction. Um, you might have automated processes that get recorded. Those probably should not be attributed to a person and vice versa. But again, if it makes sense for you, you can break that out instead of using a generic person, you could say undergraduate or first year student or a user login, whatever makes sense. And you can, again, uh, you, it's not a one size fits all even for a particular library. So you may want a person to specify generic person in one case, and you may want to specify class year in another case in your own data. There's, that's that's all, all fine. Um, and again, like anything else, you can attach more and more information to this if it suits your needs. All right, so what does all this look like when all is said and done? Now the next slide. This is a, a, a fairly simple, straightforward event packet describing a single discrete event uh, that might be sent from a library to a learning store. The first six lines or so are basically metadata about the event. They simply say that it follows the caliper spec version one, part two, uh, number uh, edition two of the profile extension, has some universal identifiers, it's a type of which profile it fits under, fits under. and then um, it's telling you there's an actor, it's just a person. And this happens to be the highest level person, it's the, what, any caliper compliance system uses to say this is a person. Um, have the action used, and it has an object which is a library space. So this would be great for you know, your annual ARL, ARL stats. How many people entered this building? There you go. You could use this to collect and count that information. On the next slide, we have a slightly more detailed sample packet. Um, the top looks very similar. It's still a person. Uh, we're not saying anything more about who this individual or what the individual was or what their context is, but we're giving more detail about the what they accessed. It's a library resource with a title and a particular ID, a DOI or a URL, and it also adds more information about where the person was when they accessed it. They happen to be off campus, which we might have determined through they're using a proxy server or an IP range from some kind of uh, from the authentication method that they used. And they, in this sample, they may have come from, uh, we, we knew in some way, whether the, because the link was in a Canvas or Blackboard site, that they accessed this in the context of a reading list for a particular specific course. Um, so this gives you a little bit more detail about the, about the use, less about the person, more about the item. But you get the idea and you can extend you know, anything here almost infinitely to, be, to give you the data that you might, uh, that you might want to have. And that is a really quick introduction to the Caliper profile. And I will now risk giving you whiplash again by elevating you to the future and uh, turn it over to Shane. Hi, uh, thanks, Ken. Um, my name is Shane Acker, and I'm with the University of Minnesota. I'm going to talk to you about what's next for the Caliper library profile and uh, how it might be used in the future. Um, so go ahead and next slide. Thanks, Megan. Um, so right now, the Caliper Library Profile is in what's called a public candidate final draft. Um, you can actually see the profile um, in all its glory if you uh, follow the link. I think it's been shared in the chat, but also it'll be on the last slide. Um, it's public and it's ready for implementation. So um, you're uh, more than welcome to uh, use it yourself and test it out. Um, in fact, we, we need uh, implementations because the approval process for Cal the Caliper spec uh, requires that. Um, we are also, though, considering, or for, for the class grant, we considered other uh, vendors and two existing tools that libraries have used for assessment purposes that we may need to emit Caliper output for learning analytics purposes. Uh, in the earlier slide, Megan uh, highlighted that OCLC was a part of the class grant. 
uh, we worked with OCLC through the class grant to consider how easy proxy could be used to output caliperized library data for use uh, uh, based on easy proxy logs. Um, a number of institutions, um, including the University of Minnesota, and I think Michigan too, have used easy proxy data uh, in the past for projects that correlate library use to student success measures. And I think uh, we all think it's very likely that easy proxy data could also be used for analytics purposes, learning analytics purposes uh, in the future. Uh, next slide, Megan. So um, again, we work with the easy proxy or uh, work with OCLC to, to think about and model how to standardize processes and workflows and create a, really a new tool uh, that could be used to create caliper output based on easy proxy logs, caliper output uh, in, in the form of this new caliper library profile. So you can see in this slide, that there's a number of uh, uh, steps in this. So we take the easy proxy logs and we feed them into this new tool and this uh, the second part of the process, which we call the enrichment process. This is where the data from the easy proxy log might be enriched uh, because as uh, some of you might know, easy proxy logs really um, can contain typically just a URL uh, maybe a user ID, that kind of thing, but that URL can be enriched, uh, especially if it has a PubMed ID or a DOI. We can glean out uh, what was the journal that was being accessed, what was the database that might have been used, um, and, and try to get some more information uh, that might be useful, again, for learning analytics pro uh, uh, processes and projects. The next stage of the process, though, would be to make a privacy decision. It was important for us to take advantage of the Caliper Library profile and how flexible it is around privacy um, and build into this tool the idea that um, information can be very specific or it can be uh, despecified. So um, you might want to be specific in the user ID that use something, but very general or broad in the case of what actually they used. So maybe user X used a database rather than the specific database or user Y accessed just an e-journal. Or you might wanna go uh, the opposite of that and, and be more general with the user, but get specific in uh, what was actually accessed. Um, this library privacy filter that this tool uh, will have uh, will make that possible. And then uh, it will uh, spit out uh, the caliper output uh, based again on the caliper library profile. Uh, and uh, that caliper um, output can then be uh, put into a learning record store or some kind of other analytics ecosystem, as it says there. Um, and um, like I said, we're, we're excited to work with OCLC on this. Uh, I believe OCLC is committed to building this, but we are working on a follow up grant right now, which could accelerate that process. So stay tuned for more information about that. Um, let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna talk about a much more specific example now, something that we're grappling with at the University of Minnesota. Next uh, slide. Um, there's a tool out there called My Learning Analytics and the University of Minnesota right now is piloting um, Myla. Um, it's a Michigan design tool um, and it's made available through Unison. Um, we're uh, all part of the Unison Consortium, two member schools, I believe, six uh, uh, schools right now are piloting uh, this tool, this learning analytics tool. It's a student facing uh, a set of visualizations based on Canvas data um, that is then placed into their learning record store, the Unison uh, learning record store. Um, the first uh, visualization is for assignment planning. Um, the second is uh, for grade distribution, shows students uh, where they fall in, um, in, the, in the course. Um, and then the final um, uh, visualization is called resources accessed. And this is where libraries come into play or could come into play. Uh, with the resources accessed dashboard, students can see uh, again, which, file, uh, which files are popular in the course and then which files are accessed most often by classmates. And the idea is, is that they can look at this dashboard to get a sense of maybe a reading or a file that they have missed uh, looking at. And as you can see, files must be uploaded to Canvas. Again, these are student-facing dashboards. Faculty can't see this, advisors can't see this. This is literally giving students their data back to them in, a, in, in unique ways that, that hopefully will help them succeed. And as you can see by the last bullet, um, uh, Michigan has done some um, evaluation and they have found that it has been, uh, had some positive results for uh, student success. Uh, next slide, please. The difficulty, though, is that at the University of Minnesota, we use Leganto, 
to create course reading lists that are then integrated into Canvas. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see how uh, Leganto integrates. Um, the, uh, the Myla resources access visualization, though, does not include readings from these lists. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of courses use Leganto to build reading lists. Um, when uh, through the piloting process, well, we, we had to recommend that, um, uh, it, that only courses that didn't use Leganto uh, should participate in the pilot because the information was incomplete. Um, if, a, if a course was using Leganto, that, that information would not be in the resources access visualization. Uh, the ramification of that is, you know, if, if Myla is uh, you know, successful in the pilot and we decide to implement it uh, across the university, faculty may need to decide whether or not they want to use Myla or if they want to use Leganto. Um, and that, uh, that's, not a, that's not a good choice as far as I'm concerned. Um, so next slide, please. So the library caliper profile or the caliper library profile could, uh, could help with this. Uh, we could configure Leganto to create caliper output uh, for inclusion into uh, Myla and again, the Unison uh, Learning Record Store. Uh, it can then be combined with other learning data that currently populates Myla. Um, and the, obviously, as, as Megan has already mentioned too, uh, including this will create a more complete picture of student engagement for these, these courses. And it would then mean that faculty don't have to make that choice between using uh, these tools. Um, the Caliper Library Profile definitely makes all of this uh, integration possible. Um, and, and I just wanted to say that this, this isn't going to be the last time that we have to make a decision like this, I think. Uh, I think these types of choices are going to become more and more prevalent for academic libraries um, as learning analytics tools become um, more widespread on our campuses. Um, and I think uh, the Caliper Library Profile is a good step in the right direction to give us the uh, option then of participating, if we so choose, and if it fits into our our privacy policies and practices, um, if we so choose, we can use the Caliper Library Profile to, to participate and be at that table. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is just a number of links, more information about the class grant, the white paper that came out. Um, there's also a link there to the, uh, the uh, library use profile that uh, Ken was talking about. Uh, and then um, the uh, LILA, or the Library Integration and Institutional Learning Analytics uh, and link is there as well for you to read over. And that is our presentation. Next slide, yep. Yeah, there's our uh, contact information if you have any questions or comments. Um, and I guess we've got plenty of time also, I think now to take questions if you have any. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Shane, Megan, and Ken, for that interesting overview of um, these new specifications and how you envision uh, seeing them used going forward. Um, the floor is now open for questions, so we invite our attendees to share any questions you might have in the Q&A box. Um, if you'd like to ask a question live, just raise your hand and I will be happy to unmute you. Um, thanks also to Andrew Pace for sharing helpful links along the way. And uh, Ken, I see, has added a link there to the recent white paper that was released in December, I believe. So we'll give folks a few minutes to think about any questions or comments they may have. Um, one thing I was wondering while we're while we're waiting for some of those questions to come in, um, do you foresee any limitations to the specifications that you have developed? Is there anything that you think um, might need to be expanded on. It sounds like you've built in a tremendous amount of flexibility, but do you envision any any limitations to them? I can take a first stab at this um, that question. 
I, I think that one of the challenges will be is, you know, and something that we spend a lot of time debating is, is what level of granularity is the right one for the main, the main event. So we, have, we end up with three to kind of describe the entire universe of things a library offers a campus. That may be too many, uh, probably not. It may be too few, it might be. But we, we sort of, we settled on the, the too few figuring that it was easier to split something later and then to have a thing that a couple of people used and then most people didn't, and then that data was more orphaned. So we, 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 we hoped that if this, uh, you know, to the extent that, that many libraries start generating events and sharing them within their campus or even across campuses through consortia or otherwise, that you would be able to drill down through the decorations on an event as opposed to having to you know, merge somehow different events that had different frameworks. So I suspect we will learn all sorts of things as we, as we pilot this. Um, and that's why we pilot things, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if, if you start using this um, and you run into things that don't seem to make sense or where the resources, the activities you're trying to describe aren't describable, please let us know. Very helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. All right. Looks like we do have some uh, questions and comments here. First from uh, Claire Stewart. Thank you for the presentation and the update. Um, she might have missed this in the update, Shane, but are the privacy filtering and enriching tools things that exist already exist at uh, Minnesota are being built via separate project, et cetera? Uh, the privacy filtering for easy proxy does not exist already. Um, the, the, the tool, the enhancement that's going to be created doesn't exist yet. Um, but we have been doing some of this stuff at University of Minnesota. A lot of what um, we discussed with uh, OCLC was based on what the University of Minnesota has been doing um, with uh, easy proxy data. Yeah. And we wanted to standardize it. and because we get a lot of questions from a lot of libraries, like how do we do the same thing? And um, we worked with OCLC to try to make that so that uh, anybody that wanted to do that with Easy Proxy could, any library. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Claire, for the question. And thanks for addressing that, Shane. And uh, Nancy also comments on privacy from a librarian's point of view, the privacy issues seem daunting. We have never associated usage with specific patrons. Mining, easy proxy, et cetera, seem to go against what the libraries are comfortable with mining if it's down to an individual level. I'll start with this one. So thanks, Nancy. That's that's a really obviously incredibly important uh, question and tricky space in doing all of this. And um, I would also invite anyone listening to look at the white paper because we tried to handle that um, or, or um, describe like our thoughts around the privacy issue more eloquently than I'm probably about to do right now. Well, it's, it's, it's fun to have something you can just like write down and, and, and get it exactly the way you want it to, to come out. But um, I'll, I'll still take a, a crack at it. So I think that you know, th these kinds of conversations around privacy are exactly the ones we should be having in our field, that things, um, are changing rapidly in terms of what kinds of technologies, um, the kinds of technologies and how much data they keep. And uh, that's both a, a homegrown stuff and vendor stuff. Um, and so we're being um, sort of forced willingly or not to have hard conversations that maybe we didn't have to have in the past. Um, what I really wanna um, want folks to talk about and think about and sort of come to their own conclusions about is how we balance competing ethics and, and values. Um, so definitely privacy is a deeply held value to anyone um, in libraries. I, I don't know anybody who doesn't care about it um, very deeply. I do think that we have to sometimes disentangle um, privacy from sort of its, its family of um, complete anonymity or confidentiality. Right, so those are two totally different things, and we tend to equate privacy with complete anonymity. Um, but privacy is actually also um, an aspect of, or confidentiality, confidentiality is sort of like what we do with that data to keep it private. That's another way of thinking about privacy. 
um, as, as protecting the data we have, not, not having any. Um, but that's a, so there's like one bucket of conversation. Another bucket of conversation is how do we balance out our drive and ethics and values around privacy with our drive and buckets or drive and values and ethics around um, equitable access and service for, in, in our case, in academic libraries, our learners and our, and our faculty. So, um, you know, we are just as duty bound as we are to keep uh, data private to do something with the data we have. Mm -hmm. And when we look at current realities in higher ed, um, whether it's, you know, sort of a the big metrics where we know that there are retention problems. We also know that there are learning thing, you know, learning gaps that um, shouldn't have to exist and so on. So whether you're thinking about like the big success metrics or the specific like learning in a particular course and, the, and, and understanding and gaining what you're supposed to get out of a college education, um, we have obligations there too, right? So not only to support students in, in achieving what they're here at the institution to achieve, um, but also thinking about if we could help and we don't, what are the ethical implications of that? Um, what about the equity issues, right? So if we know that we could be doing better services or more targeted services or resources or what have, or better facilities, or if we know what we could dismantle things, if only we knew about them or had uh, better detail on them and we don't, you know, then we uphold structures and systems that you know, we can't really be proud of as a profession. So figuring out how to balance those two things, which are oftentimes posed as complete, you know, like, oh, they're in battle against each other. But in, in fact, we just need to find where our line is between those things, right? So what is truly private and we would never ever want to capture in any way versus what is something that is part of the learning endeavor and we can help students with. And that's why one of the examples we showed was a reading list example. Um, you know, uh, readings from a particular course are not necessarily like personal investigation um, as you might see with some sorts of data. So there's, there's all these layers and things to consider in this territory. My favorite word for this territory is nuanced. <laughs> nothing, nothing is clear cut, everything is complicated. So, um, so there's all of that. So that's bucket number two. How do we balance our values around privacy with our values around service, equity, um, access? And then there's another bucket that is important for this conversation is then is that the, the Caliper um, library profile doesn't prescribe any level of personally identifiable information that is completely left up to the institution or actually the library's choice in, in consultation with what kinds of research questions they need to know. I am definitely personally not a fan of going on fishing expeditions and data. I think you should have research questions driving your, your concerns. What are the big problems? How are you gonna solve them? What data do you need to solve that? Um, how do you protect? What are the governance policies in place? Who has access? How do you make sure that that access is protected? How do you go back and look at, um, uh, you know, the you set something up and you think it's going right, but if there's not human eyes on it, you might be inadvertently doing something um, with with the processes. So continual reflection and evaluation of what it is you're doing with the data. So all of that is a part of it, but the Caliper Library profile doesn't prescribe that you have to keep that data. It just enables those enables you to count person used thing. Um, or to, if you have an important research question that needs answered so that you can serve your students equitably and well, it provides the possibility for that. But you'd have to go through the, all the thought process. Um, and I think there was another bucket, but I can't remember what the, there's a hole in my bucket and I don't remember. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, that comment, Nancy and Megan. Thank you so much for sort of unpacking all of the nuances there. Um, it's a trade-offs too. Um, so yeah, really interesting. Um, Jimmy Gaffrey um, has, a, has a question. Thanks for the presentation. Appreciated the attention to privacy. Could you envision this shaping future approaches to library services that would involve, uh, that would involve opt in or opt out of tracking for students? I, I could try, I guess. Um, I don't, so the, the Caliper Library profile will capture uh, use events. Um, and if, if there was going to be an opt-in or an opt-out process, those would probably be separate from 
from what the caliper library profile would would provide for. Um, I suppose um, you know if you wanted to build an opt uh, in um, and somebody didn't, then their data would not be captured and not uh, be rendered in the caliper library profile. And on the flip side, if there was an opt out, uh, possibly um, data could be removed from the learning record store after its input. Um, so yeah, I mean, I suppose uh, thinking could go around uh, the caliper library profile, but I see the I see those two things as being separate. So, Ken, did you have anything? No, that that was that, that lines up with with my answer. I mean, I, I think that I I. I at the risk of saying something that would be taken out of context, um, but I I'll run with it. One of the risks is that if we're trying to understand global usage of a system, enable, you know, not letting people, uh, not having it be global really harms being able to find out what is where we're not doing well or where we're doing particularly well. So I, I think that the caliper spec doesn't take a stance on what gets included. Um, a library or an institution is most certainly empowered and invited to figure out what makes sense. Um, maybe there are some consensuses across, or a consensus across all academic libraries uh, or all, all libraries about what what level, you know, is this only opt in? So, which is is certainly a very valid, and I, I understand that approach very well. But it means probably that we will not have data we could actually do anything with at least not at any scale. And, and again, if that is our decision, then that is a decision and that, that reflects uh, a, a firmly held library belief. If it's opt out, um, again, we will, we will have some challenges in, in trying to understand who is not in the data, which exacerbates to an extent the same conditions we have now where we have the data, but we don't know anything about anybody. So it's all, it's, the, it's tre treating towards the average. I don't think there is an answer here. Um, I, I think that there's something that you would have to figure out uh, at your own institution with your own staff in the library and on the campus where you're, that, whose ecosystem you are part of to figure out what makes sense. Um, bringing in student voices into these decisions, I think is also really, really important. Um, and uh, at least from, from my own institution is something that we have only done on the margins if at best. And I, I, we are starting to think about that very, very seriously and realizing that we, we're making decisions or not making decisions, uh, but we're, it, whichever way we go, we're not even asking if there's a decision to be made of the people whose data we are probably talking about. And I think that that's something that I, I, would, I would hope that many, that, that many of us are, are also coming to that realization. Um, even if it is late as it might be in my, as it is in my own case. Thank you. Thanks for the, the question, Jimmy. And now we have another question and we probably have time. This is probably about the last question we have time for. So uh, I'll read this now from Eric. Really interesting work. Thank you. How have other learning analytic areas handled student privacy and how does FERPA factor in? So I'll, I'll respond generally, and then Shane and Ken will say something smarter. Um, so <laughs> I think, um, you know, I think if you're if we're talking about across campus, uh, I think most of the work on student privacy is in protecting the data that exists through policies, practices, governance, the hiring of chief privacy officers, um, you know, really using all of the um, both technological and process protections that are available. Um, I don't. I don't know that FERPA figures in um, as much because this is sort of information that the institution has and needs to have in order to operate. Um, so on, like the opt-in, opt-out question, when you're talking about um, uh, learning management system data, in order to participate in the campus students have to oftentimes engage or all the time engage with a learning management system. So that's just sort of part of the process. And I think there's um, on, on most campuses, something that students probably um, accept in the fine print without reading. And so we do need to do some work about how we educate students to understand how their data is being used. I applaud libraries in particular 
that are making sure that their privacy policies um, reflect what is actually happening, not necessarily what we wish were happening, um, and doing that work of being honest and sort of doing an audit about, you know, what, what kind of data are we keeping? Um, but at the, at the institutional level, you know, there are so many layers of um, uh, technology protection, but also governance policies, processes, who has access, you know, all of that is getting laid out. But I think it's even, you know, if there are holes, I hope that they are getting addressed now when so much of the student activity is technology enabled. And so where maybe some campuses where that has um, not been updated adequately, I hope that they're looking at them more thoroughly now since students are engaging almost entirely through technology. Shane, Ken, do you have anything to add to that? Real quick, I guess, uh, I think my impression has been outside the libraries. Um, IT has been more focused on data security, ethical uses of data, and transparency of how the data is being used. Um, privacy, of course, is important, um, but those three areas um, seem to be taking precedence, and they're, they're committed to maintaining student privacy, but they're also committed to using the data um, to help students succeed and using it in ethical ways. That seems to be where the conversation is. And I, I would just uh, build on that a little bit. I think that there, there, there in my library anyway, there was a, a fairly healthy and I think mostly inconclusive debate about what is a record as defined by FERPA that applies to the library. And, and there's the letter of FERPA and there's the spirit of FERPA. And a lot of library data, I think, which certainly falls under the spirit and may not be under the letter. Now, that's, I, I don't want to say just because it doesn't say that in FERPA of the law that we shouldn't be paying attention to it. But I think that there, there is a large gray area that falls under the ethics and the, the, the institutional needs, the institutional desires, the, and the motives uh, that may push a particular point one way or the other in a given context. So it is very uncut and dried. Great, thank you. Uh, great way to wrap that up. Thanks for the question, Eric, and thanks to the three of you for addressing that. And now we are uh, just a bit past the hour, so uh, thanks for hanging in there with us, everyone. Um, I think uh, Megan and Ken are able to stick around a little bit longer uh, after I turn off the recording. If anybody wants to hang out and chat with them, I think Shane has another commitment. But um, I will, with that, close the session. Thanks to our wonderful presenters. Thank you to our attendees. And I hope we'll see you back at CNI for our last uh, live project briefing tomorrow. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye bye.